Matthew chapter 8. I am so excited to be here. I am telling you, I love it when I have a clear message from God. God couldn't make this morning's sermon so much clearer. I was so excited to preach on this morning come Monday evening. And then I start studying for Sunday night, and we're going to talk about the church this evening. I am so used to now hearing from God. If there comes a day that I don't hear from him, I'm going to be in trouble. But I love hearing from God and a clear message on being a disciple. If I ask the average person, what is a disciple, you probably say someone that teaches the Bible. And I would tell you that's wrong. And I'm going to explain why. Anybody can teach the Bible. It doesn't mean they're saved. And the people that you teach the Bible, even though they've been taught, doesn't mean they're saved. So I would tell you that it's not discipling someone. Discipling someone is living by example and teaching them by example. And we're going to get into that this morning. We discussed Matthew and we're going through and Again, you just got to love scripture. Everything is in such order. And before I get to this, I wanted to mention about, tell them about Jesus. You know, I was praying this morning and I was thinking about Pastor Gregory and one of the things he used to say, and you know what I'm getting at in just a moment. He would probably chuckle if he came to our church this morning and say, praise God. One of the things he used to have, and I haven't told the church, but Every so often, and then more times than not, as he got older, uh, time starts slipping away from him as he started preaching. And he would often say, one of these days, I'm going to bring a gun in and shoot that clock. And lo and behold, we have tell them about Jesus that replaced the clock. So what a blessing. Matthew chapter 8, and I invite you to stand, verses 23 through 27. Are you a disciple? What is the true meaning of discipleship, not what we think. You know, I had a lot of things go on this morning. There are churches that are falling by the wayside because they're not preaching true doctrine. They're not preaching what God has for them. Let's see what God has for us this morning. In verse 23, verses 23 for 27, Matthew 8, and when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, then arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Lord, we're so thankful that we hear from you. Lord, what an honor and a privilege to hear the word of God. Lord, I just pray that as your word goes forth, that the saints would be stirred in their hearts of what true discipleship is. And Lord, if someone is not saved, may they come to the saving grace this morning. In your son's name, amen. We just got done in order. We're going through Matthew, and we're talking about the Apostle Matthew, so we went through Matthew. Jesus takes the scene, and he preaches a sermon. Lo and behold, there's power in the word. After the message is preached, that's not the end of the message. He goes and a leper heals. He heals a leper. He heals a centurion's uh, sick person in the house. Then he heals Peter's mother-in-law. And then he talks about people that want to follow him. We went through that. And Jesus said, because they gave up some excuses, 
Let the dead bury their dead. And I went through that with you, and Jesus knew their hearts. He knew there was disbelief. And as we see that the crowd gets smaller, smaller, and smaller. You've seen a lot of people, the word says multitudes, that comes to see him preach. But when it comes to following Jesus, very few people are there. What is a true disciple? We always hear this word, we are to teach, and yes, we are in the main verb. I'll never forget it the rest of my life. The main verb in the Great Commission is to teach. But what is true discipleship? Again, Fawn and I, when we were in church, lo and behold, I was a lost person teaching a Sunday school class. And I would tell you, I wasn't a disciple then. There are some people that hear the teachings of God, but they don't receive God. Therefore, they are not disciples. So what is true discipleship? There's a test that Jesus tests them. He's always teaching them. Very few people got on the boat. Jesus didn't deny anybody following him. But lo and behold, only a few were saved. It reminds me of the church today. I surrounded myself with some good preachers and pastors when I became a pastor. Every one of them. Do not assume that half your congregation is saved. Very few people receive the word of God. The Bible even says... Broad is the way, but very few enter into his kingdom. So what is true discipleship? Number one, a true disciple is one that has accepted Christ. That Christ is in your life. When Christ enters, things change. And there's some evidence of change. I emphasize a lot, and I'm going to emphasize this evening... I'm going to even bring up marriage this morning. Salvation, uh, marriage is a perfect picture of salvation. God instituted the marriage before the church. And I got to thinking, and I, I preached on it, and sometimes I wish I would have said more in some of my preaching. But if you think about it, God instituted the marriage three or 4,000 years before the church. I think that he wanted us to get used to being married and getting that right. Because if you don't get marriage right, the church is not going to be right. Over 4,000 years, the church didn't become in existence. But the home was. I truly believe that God wanted the home to be right, to be structured right. How on earth can you operate a church if you don't have a right home? There's no reason, there's a, there's a reason why the Bible says for someone to become a pastor, their home must be right. But very few are. So what is a true disciple? And number one, a disciple is someone that has Christ in your life. And there's evidence of Christ being in your life. When Fawn entered my life, when we got married, when she accepted and said, I do, when I said I do, our lives changed. At that very moment, we became one. When you accept Christ as your Savior, that very moment, you become one with him. Fawn was going to be in my life wherever I go. That was new to me. And I would be wherever she goes. From then on, she would be known as Fawn Sears. When you're saved, you should be known from then on as a Christian. There should be some evidence. 
She was now going to live where I live. Because we married right. A small two-bedroom house in Taylor, Michigan, also known as Taylor Tucky. For those that live in Michigan in that area, Taylor is made fun of because a lot of people from the South settled in Taylor to work for the auto company. So we over the years became known as Taylor Tucky. There was evidence that Fawn was going to be in my life and I was going to be in hers and people seen Fawn with me. And people seen me with Fawn. When you get saved and you become one with Christ, people should see Christ with you. In you. There should be some evidence there. There's some evidence of change when you're saved. There's evidence that Christ is with you. And people should see Christ everywhere you go. Everywhere I go, people know that no, Fawn and I were married. They know Fawn's my wife. When you're saved, people ought to know who your Savior is. Everywhere you go. If you're saved, it should not be a surprise to those that are close to you. One should know that, and they should not be ashamed, they should have told others about their salvation story. We're excited, and I hope you are. When you get married, you tell everybody. Usually the bride gets excited and tells everyone. Those that are saved, you should be so excited that you tell everyone, especially those that are close to you, what has happened in your life. And when they know and around you, they should see a product of Christ in you. A true disciple is one that has accepted Christ into their life. They're one with Christ. There's evidence that Christ is in them. That everywhere they go, they see Jesus with you. And a disciple knows everywhere they go, Christ will be with them. Number one, Christ enters your life. Number two, a true disciple follows him. They followed him into the ship. And when he was entered into the ship, the disciples followed him. Have you followed Christ? Here's a few things that a saved person, that a disciple would do following Christ. Number one, when they accept Christ, they would follow Christ in baptism. A true disciple is one who has followed Christ and believers' baptism. In Acts chapter 2, verse 41, then they that were gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. A disciple is one that has Jesus with them, that follows Christ, that has followed Jesus in believers' baptism. And number three of this sub-point, they have became a member of a church. In Acts chapter 2, verse 41, again, in this order, those that gladly received his word, those that are saved, were baptized. And the same day, they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. That means they joined other believers. They joined a local church. A disciple is someone that follows Jesus, that follows his word. Do I have to say it? And I will. I'm going to tell you every time I get the chance that the word is Jesus. And if the word says that we are to be baptized and we are to be added to the church, then we ought to follow Jesus. And as we are saved and follow him in baptism and have him lead us to a church. And join a local church. The word follow, especially here, means, precedes, and it emphasizes, comes before. That means that a true disciple will bring things before Christ. Before anything. 
A true disciple brings things to Christ before anyone else. Do we understand that? We don't get on the phone and call our friends and what do you think? What does Christ think? What does the word of God say? Did you not hear me that a disciple follows the word? Follows Jesus. Follows what the word says. When you are married, your spouse should always come before someone or something else. Do you understand? I am telling you, marriage is a picture of salvation. When you are married to Christ, he comes before anybody else. When you're married to your spouse, your spouse should be and come before anybody else. Or anything else. Before a sports game. Come on, ladies, I thought I was going to game in out of that one. Aren't you excited from hearing from God today? Am I talking to the disciples? Are you a disciple? Maybe it's sinking into some people. Maybe I'm not a disciple after all. Disciples are few. Are you a true disciple? Have you followed God? Have you accepted him as Lord and Savior? Have you followed him in baptism? Have you joined a church? The Bible says that they were added 3,000 souls after they were baptized. Does Christ come before anything or anyone? A disciple of Christ is one that has received Christ into their lives and they're a follower. One who followed in believer's baptism, one who has joined other believers. Christ comes before anything else in your life. Maybe you never heard this before. Well, I thought a disciple, all he does is teach. Oh, no. A disciple is much more than that. How in the world can you teach if you are not a disciple yourself? How can you teach what a disciple is if you're not? I know some of this it may be new to you or you never heard this before. Well, maybe you never heard the correct interpretation of a disciple, what a disciple does. A disciple follows the word of God. There's evidence that Jesus is with him or her. You put Jesus before anything or anyone. Christ comes first. In Matthew 8, 24, And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with waves, but he was asleep. Can you back up just a few moments? If you notice, the disciples are alone with Christ. A true disciple spends some alone time with Jesus. Do you spend some time with Christ? I'm not talking about on Sundays. We're all here together today. I'm talking about by yourself, at home. Instead of watching your favorite stupid show, is there time that you spend with Christ? If you didn't hear what I said a few moments ago, a true disciple lives the example. That's how he teaches others. Children are not stupid. To teach your children what a disciple is, mom, dad, you have to live the example of a disciple. You cannot just tell them. That's not teaching them. Teaching your child about discipleship is living the example. Mom, dad, are you saved? Do you put Christ first? Let me hear again to remind you, kids are not dumb. They know if mom and dad's saved. 
They know if mom and dad's been baptized. They know if mom and dad belongs to a church. They know if mom and dad spend a long time with God. If you're not doing that, you are not teaching your kids to be disciples. You're not. You must live the example. So many parents, I don't know why my child doesn't believe in God. Don't know why they're not in church. Are you a true disciple? I've taught them, but have you taught them as a true disciple? There's a difference. Satan knows scripture. Lost people have memorized scripture. A true disciple follows scripture, lives like Jesus. That's how you teach someone true discipleship. Sip. That's how you teach your kids true discipleship. That's how a church teaches true discipleship. A church that follows God. A church that does what God tells them to do. Realizing that God is the authority over them. And behold, there rose a great tempest in the sea, and insomuch that the ship was covered with waves, but he was asleep. And number three, a disciple. They know they will fight and struggle with their flesh. They know that struggles are coming. No, I am not a feel-good preacher. I am not someone that teaches you that you're going to have your life is going to be okay and a bed of roses as a Christian. A true disciple knows there's going to be struggle. They know it. They know they're going to fight with their flesh. This word arose. If you study the Greek, it means marry to. There's a history. You know yourself. You know problems are going to happen. You're going to struggle. A disciple is going to struggle. Pastors will struggle. Any believer is going to struggle. And you're going to go through a struggle. Because you're still married to your flesh. I was contemplating if I should bring this up, and it's a little bit of deep theology. The Bible says when you're saved here on earth, you're going through a process. And I thought about how can I say this? Well, the Lord gave me some kind words of wisdom. That once you start the process, there's no going back. Once you're saved, you're saved. But the Bible makes it very clear that when you're on this earth, you're going through a process. You're not 100% saved. Now, this is a little bit of theology. Hear me out. I'm not saying you can lose your salvation. I don't want to hear anybody say that. Well, pastor said you can lose I did not say that. Again, once you start the process of salvation, there's no going back. You're in the process of being saved. You're going to go through problems. The reason why is because you're still married to this flesh. And you're going to struggle. If you are 100% saved, you could be in the presence of God. And you cannot be in the presence of God while you're still in this flesh. You're still married to it. Where do you think we got the words, till death do us part? Our flesh does not leave our body until death do us part. And as long as you have this body, as long as you have this flesh, you're going to struggle. Don't get me wrong. Again, I'm going to emphasize, once you're saved, you cannot lose your salvation. Once you start the process, there's no going back. But you are going to struggle as long as you're on this earth. You have that flesh that's always going to fight you. In Romans 7, 18, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good. 
For to will and present with me, but how to perform which is good I find not. A true disciple understands. In a nutshell, they understand they're not perfect. Just because you're saved, some people have a chip on their shoulders. You're not perfect. And someone that is saved, someone that is a true disciple here on this earth, knows they are not perfect. And behold, there rose a great tempest in the sea, and so much, and the ship was covered with waves, but he was asleep. In us, there will always be conflict, evil, war. But in him, there's always peace. In Jesus, there is always peace. We're going to struggle. Our flesh is going to attack us. That's why we are constantly warned as Christians to have the armor of God on us. But always in Christ, you will always find peace in Jesus. There's always peace with Christ. There's always going to be a conflict in us. It will stay with us until death do us part. That is why our flesh must die. Hopefully there's a better understanding of what you had just said this morning. I hope I do not hear people come out of this church and say, Pastor said you can lose your salvation. No, you cannot. But you are going to struggle as a Christian. You're going to go through things because you still have this fleshly body. But in Jesus, there is always peace. Number five, verse 25 and 26. And his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he saith unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye little faith? And then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Number four, if you're keeping count, a disciple, a true disciple of Christ, knows they have to ask God for help. They go to God for help. Again, if you want to teach your kids about discipleship, live as a disciple. That's how you teach them. When you go to help, who do you go to? And by the way, your children are watching. Do you understand as a true saved person, a person that is a disciple of Christ, goes to God for help? Again, you got to love the order. We're going to struggle. Therefore, we must have help from someone. Our help comes from the Lord. And someone that's a disciple knows they need to ask help. We can't do it on ourselves. Again, we're going to talk about the church this evening. And one of the problems the church has is they think they know better than God. They don't know how to ask God for help. Praise God, I'm not someone that knows I don't know everything. I constantly need help. I constantly need help understanding scripture. God, what is it you want me to preach? How do you want to be a husband today? I honestly don't know. But I know someone who does. And that's God. And if we follow his word, you're going to have peace in your life. You're going to have peace in your marriage. You're going to have peace with your children. You're going to have peace in the church. A disciple asks for help. In number 5 in verse 27, I love this one. But the men marveled, saying, what manner of man is this, 
that even the winds and the sea obey him. A disciple, a true disciple of God, will see marvelous things from God. This morning, are you a disciple? Do you follow God? If you follow this recipe, I guarantee you, you will see something marvelous that God will do in your life. For those who accept Jesus as their Savior, for those who follow him in believer's baptism, those that join a church that God leads them to, those that understand they're not perfect, those that know they're going to struggle, and they know that Jesus is the only place they're going to find peace. And those that ask God for help, you're going to see some marvelous things in their life. You will marvel. Uh, you've heard me say this over and over again. Jesus is the only one that you will marvel over. But a true disciple knows that. These disciples of God seen some marvelous things. You know, I was tickled to death Wednesday night over some things. How well, this church marvels over what we've done. And let us never forget that it's no one person. That's not us. It's God. And it's because we follow God. We are able to see some things that will marvel us. And to God be the glory for it. To be a disciple, you must live the example of a disciple. To teach and disciple someone else is more than teaching. It's more than knowing a few Bible stories. It's no more than knowing and memorizing verses. Is actually living, living the testimony of a disciple. That's how Jesus taught his disciples. He lived as a disciple. Jesus served. Jesus set the example of true discipleship. And you got to love it. Because at the same time, this is, again, if you follow the sequence of events, this is the first sign, this is the first evidence of true discipleship. This is the first time that people followed Jesus, first time after the sermon, that people actually responded. They received him. And let me just tell you, it was very, very few that did. If you notice in the beginning, multitudes heard the sermon. I would dare say thousands. And come to find out there's 11 disciples that actually followed Jesus. And if you read the sequence, Jesus didn't turn anybody down. They just came up with excuses why not to follow him. They wanted to put conditions on Christ. The Great Commission, we are to teach and disciple. But I am here to tell you the only way you're going to teach someone true discipleship is living the example of discipleship. How in the world can you teach someone to disciple if you're not willing to follow Jesus yourself? This morning, maybe this opened the eyes of some people. 
Discipling someone is not just getting the Bible and dusting it off on Sundays. I went to a discipleship class. I dare say it's not just reading the scripture to your kids. It's more than telling the stories to your kids. It's actually seeing your kids, your kids seeing you following the Lord. This morning, the test of a true disciple. Can you say, I am a disciple of Christ? The test is, have you received Christ? Do you spend some alone time with him? Do you follow him? Do you put him first above anything else? Do you know that you're not perfect? It's sad to say some people think they're all that, and they're not. A true disciple knows they're not perfect. A true disciple knows there's going to be some times of struggle. But then a true disciple is nowhere to go when they struggle. And you're only going to have peace in Christ. And when you follow that, my goodness, what God will show you. You cannot put a price of one of your own children. Mom, Dad, how do you get saved? You know how they come to know to come to mom and dad? Because they see mom and dad following Christ. Harmony, a couple years ago, when we came down here, struggled. I was doing something, I think I was doing some prison ministry. And Fawn called and Harmony had some questions about salvation. I turned that car around, excited. There's no greater joy, especially for a mom and dad that's saved, that a child is inquiring about salvation. And then as you see your kids grow older, knowing that they're going to go to God, when they struggle. Teenager, you are going to struggle when you first leave home. Toilet paper doesn't just show up. You actually have to pay for electricity. There are so many things that you're going to go through. Go to God when you struggle. Follow him. When you leave mom and dad's, especially if you're saved, get involved in a church. Join others. Go where God leads you. If you're not right for God, if, you, if you're saved and you've never been baptized, follow him in baptism. And maybe you're saved and baptized and you've never joined a church, you've never gone to a church. Join a church. Specifically, go where God leads you and join that church. You're going to struggle. Can I give you some advice? Go to God when you struggle. I love it that Jesus is just sleeping there. And some people will read that and they'll come up to their own conclusion. But what I see and what God shows me is that Jesus is the only place that you're going to find peace. Jesus is like, what's wrong with you guys? Don't you know I am where the peace is? And don't you, and I'm telling you, I want to experience some things of God. Don't you want to see some marvelous things from God? The people in the Old Testament, they saw some marvelous things because they did what God asked them to do. Simple as that. Will you do what the Lord asks you to do as we stand together?